Hi everyone, welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name's Anna and on my channel we talk about true crime stories, cold cases, murder mysteries, and sometimes I do my makeup and sometimes I just talk to you guys. And I think in my last video I did my makeup, so today we're actually going to be doing my makeup again. And I'm actually doing it in the middle of the day, so it's not 4 a.m. So I'm actually proud of myself. But I do want to give a disclaimer. We are going to be talking about a true crime story. And it is a solved one. It's very sad. But there will be adult dialogue, adult description of crime scenes, content. You know, I just want to, like I said, give my little disclaimer that I normally do. So we're going to get right into today's story. Today's story is about Chris Lane. And his tragic, tragic story. But we're going to get right into it. So Chris Lane was from Melbourne, Australia. He had three older sisters. He was extremely well at baseball. Like, he was very, very well, like, at baseball. Like, he did so good. Um, he loved it so much. He wanted to go pro one day. It was just, it was a really good dream for him to have. And his family... <clears throat> his sisters and his mom and dad, they fully supported him and loved him. He was just an all-around good person. Their whole family was. They were very well-liked. They were in a good community. It was just great. So, like I said, he was very kind and very fun. Everyone loved him. His parents were very supportive. He actually ended up getting a baseball scholarship to play in America at East Central University in Atta, Oklahoma. And that was a very, very big deal for him because, you know, it was a baseball scholarship in America. Like, that was, that was a really big deal. He was super excited. He could not wait to go. So, whenever the time came around, him and his family, they got his stuff together, he said his goodbyes, and he headed to America to live out his dream of playing baseball and to become something and do something for himself like he wanted to. So, he gets to Oklahoma, and while he's there, he meets this girl, and her name is Sarah Harper. She was a fellow athlete as well. She was on a golf scholarship. She was very good, very athletic, very sporty. And in an interview, when I was doing my research, she talks about how she didn't make it easy for Chris at all. She kind of played hard to get. But she said that, you know, he just hit her sweet spot and she couldn't help but falling for him. So, of course, they fell in love with each other, and their relationship was very, very good. And a fun little fact that I learned was how Sarah met Chris's parents. Chris and Sarah were laying in bed one night, and Chris's mom had actually called him on FaceTime, and Sarah apparently was laying, like, in bed with him, and his mom saw, like, a little bit of her arm and was kind of all like, who's that? Who's that? And so Chris was like, uh, yeah, this is Sarah. So that's how she got introduced to, you know, his family. And Chris's family loved Sarah. His mom thought that she was absolutely beautiful and, you know, that's just, that was her first impression of her, that she was beautiful. So, Sarah and Chris, their relationship was going very well. And they started to make plans to go back to Melbourne, Australia, to meet, you know, Chris's family. And just spend some time with them before they went to school. And got, you know, heavily involved in sports. And, you know, they weren't really going to have time for you know, anything else, like, so they just wanted to go ahead and get all the time that they could together before they had to go back to school, so that's exactly what they did, Chris called his mom to, you know, make plans for the hotels and everything, and Chris's mom was looking for cheap hotels to try to, you know, save a little bit of money 
<laughs> well, for the trip. But Chris was all like, no, Mom. Like, Sarah deserves the best of the best. And I want her to have the best of the best. And Chris's mom claims that in that moment, she knew that her son was in love with Sarah. And she was all like, you know, oh, you want to protect her. Like, you want to give her the best of the best. So you really love this girl. And, of course, he did. It was clear that they were very in love with each other. And so they set out on their long journey to Australia. They spent quite a few weeks there. And they had an amazing time together with his family. Like I said, his family loved her a lot. And they all got along. And it was just an all-around really, really good trip. So in that moment, all is going good. Everything is just really, really fun. And sadly, they had to come back home because, you know, the trip was over. Like I said, they had to go back to school. You know, it was just supposed to be like a little a little getaway for a little bit before they had to go to college and things get serious. So they started their long journey back home from Australia. And, you know, they were very, very tired when they got back. And they also wanted to spend some time. There's a fly in here, and it's going to drive me insane. Sorry. <laughs> but they also wanted to spend some time with Sarah's family. And so that's exactly, you know, what they did. They got back home. Like I said, they were very, very tired. So Sarah's family went and got them from the airport, and they went to her house or, you know, her parents' house. And that this was, you know, back in Oklahoma, this, there was, it was like 90 minutes from the college, so it wasn't that far away. They woke up the next morning, and it started off as a normal day. They got up, they went to Walmart, Sarah and Chris did as a family, and they ran some errands, and they just, you know, it was a normal, a normal day. Well, it was particularly hot that day, and Chris like to go on runs for some reason when it was like the hottest time of the day and that's exactly what he planned on doing and Sarah actually had to go to work later that day and Chris was going to take her and you know come pick her up whenever she got done with her work so they got ready for, or Sarah got ready for work. Chris got ready for his run. And he was going to pack before he went for a run, but he decided to just wait, you know, to pack for school until they got back. So that's exactly what he did. He took Sarah to work. He came home. He got ready to go on a run. And this was around 2.55 p.m. And at that same time, Chancey Luna, who was 16, Michael Jones, who was 17, and Edward James, who was 15, were three young delinquents who were known for making some trouble, and they were also riding around at the same exact time that Chris decided to go on his run that day. So they were riding around in Michael James's car, Michael was driving, James was in the passenger seat, and Chancey Luna was in the back seat of the car. So, later, when, you know, later on in the story, according to James Edwards, the boys, they had gotten some weed, and they had gone to the store, and they were rolling up some weed. They were riding around in the same direction that Chris Lane was riding in and for some reason he claims that Chancey was in the back seat he had a gun and Michael swerved the car very close to Chris Lane who was jogging minding his own business and Chancey from the back seat with his gun shot and killed Chris Lane so, that is a story that James Edwards told. Now, there is a documentary out on YouTube that is called In Cold Blood, The Chris Lane Story. 
It's done by an Australian reporter. I'll link it down below in the description box if you would like to look into it. But, basically, he got a chance to interview the driver of the vehicle, Michael Jones, who was 17 at the time of the crime. And Michael had a completely different, you know, event of story to tell about what happened that day. And I am going to tell you Michael's story and the actual, this is the actual, like, official story that is reported and, you know, is what, what was said to have actually happened in that time. So, the boys were riding around. They, you know, that part was true. They were riding around in Michael Jones's car. They had recently picked up Edwards from a friend's house because he had a court date for, you know, something like completely unrelated to this at all. So, he actually had a court date. And so that's why they were, you know, originally like together. And so the boys, they did go to the store. They did get a cigar to roll up and to smoke and ride around before they had to go to Edward's, you know, court date. So Michael said that at that time the boys left the store. They were rolling up, they were riding around. And they spotted Chris jogging on the side of the road, minding his own business. And Michael says that he heard Edwards and Luna, you know, snickering. And he asked them what they were talking about. And he was told to basically shut the fuck up and mind his own business. So, that's exactly, you know, I guess what he did. And... At that time, the boys were at an intersection across the road from an elementary school. Michael kept driving in the same direction that Chris was running in. And so Michael said that whenever Chris was running, they got very, very close to him. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he heard a gunshot and saw Chancey, or Luna, sorry, saw Luna reaching from the back seat and shooting his gun. And then he said that he saw Chris fall to the ground and grabbing his side. And he said at this point, he had no idea that if Chris was dead or, you know, what was going on. He was just, he knew that Chris was injured and that Luna was responsible for what was going on. So, they sped off, and thankfully, they were in a neighborhood, so they had to do, you know, a lot of twists and turns, and they were around a bunch of houses. So, the boys continued to drive, and they went to an empty parking lot to store the twenty two revolver and Michael's intake manifold underneath the hood of his car, along with 104 bullets for the twenty two revolver. After they hid the gun, the boys actually went to James's court date like nothing happened. They just went like they didn't just hurt somebody. It was, you know, it just, it, it didn't matter to them. Like, I don't, I'm, side note, I'm kind of doing like a low key, maybe, I don't know. I'm adding a little bit of color, like makeup look because it's just, it's a normal day. But anyways. Back to the story. Sorry. Um, but, so, like I said, the boys, they went to James's court date. Edwards, sorry. They went to his court date. They, you know, like nothing happened. And after that, they parted ways. Well, Edwards parted ways, really. But Luna and Michael, they stayed together. And actually... Like, dumbasses, sorry, but they were, actually, like, dumbasses, they went back to the scene of the crime. Michael claims that Luna wanted to see, you know, what was going on to see if, like, police officers had came or, you know, just to get, you know, a general idea of, like, what was going on, I guess. He just wanted to be nosy, see what had happened. 
So, obviously, whenever they pulled up, there were police officers, there was tape everywhere, and there was Chris Lane's body <clears throat> on the side of the road. And in that moment, Michael says that Chansey starts to kind of panic a little bit. He realizes what he's done. And he was quoted saying, oh, shit, I killed that motherfucker. That was his quote. And, you know, he was, like I said, rightfully so, freaking the heck out because he committed murder. So he knew at that point that he was going to have to run and that he was going to be a suspect and that he was going to be probably looked for. Because, you know, like I said, they were in a neighborhood. How are they not going to be seen, you know? Like, obviously, stupid. But anyways, so at that point... The, like I said, you know, the boys had split up, but they actually met back up because they, you know, knew that something had happened. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Excuse me. <clears throat> Anyways, so like I said, they knew that something had happened to Chris, so they met back up with each other to kind of hide out. And this was around like five o'clock. They got back up with Edwards, and they managed to stay low for about an hour. And, which, anyway, I'm, never mind, I'm not going to interrupt. Okay, so, like I said, they managed to lay low for about an hour, but for some reason, Mr. James Edwards decided that he was in the mood to cause some more trouble. And, you know, he wasn't done feeling spicy. Feeling like he wanted to hurt somebody, I guess. So, in that moment, he had actually had some beef with a, another dude. And they call, he called him out on it. And so, he was like, you know, pull up, dude. Like, meet me at this church. He gave him to Addy, and he went there. All the boys did, all three of them. They went to this church to wait for this other guy to pull up. And it was quoted saying that Edward said that he had a hot piece of lead for his ass and that he would be waiting on him. And at this point, the boys, they kind of were like, all right, dude, you know, you don't need to be doing this. We just committed a, like, really crazy crime. We need to be laying low. We don't need to be out here doing dumb crap like they were. I mean, it was dumb what they did anyways, but you know what I'm saying. But, so at that point, they were trying to convince him to just get back in the car and to just leave it alone and for them to just be able to get on about their business and to leave. Well, unbeknownst to them, at this point... There was a guy across the road from the church that actually knew who James Edwards was. And he ended up calling the police and letting them know, like, what was going on. That who was at the church and that he had a gun and that he was waiting outside of the vehicle. And that thing just seemed, you know, real, real suspicious. And... So, at this point, Chris is on the side of the road. There was a neighbor who actually witnessed what was going on. And he was able to identify the vehicle, you know, the make and the model. He was able to identify that to police officers to help them. But this man, this neighbor... He saw what happened. He ran over there to Chris to try and help him in any way, you know, possible. And just being a very good person. And also, there was another woman who was driving along the same road and saw Chris and this neighbor, you know, on the side of the road. And, of course, she pulled over to help to call 911. And that's exactly what she did. The 911 call is very frantic and it's very sad. And if you're like sensitive, you know, to stuff like that, I would not watch it or listen to it at all. 
it's gonna make you really sad. But um she was she was just, you know, telling the police officers everything that she could about what was going on and you know, they were just trying they were just trying to help all that they could. And at that point they were on the phone with paramedics and police officers and they were trying to roll Chris over, you know, in case they had to do emergency, you know, CPR on him or something like that. And at that moment, you know, he's covered in blood. He's just soaked. It's just everywhere. It's underneath him. It's in the grass. It's on the road. It's just, it's everywhere. And, you know, it wasn't looking good for him whatsoever. So they flipped him over. Like I said, to try to give him emergency, you know, CPR if they needed to. And in that moment, it was said that the bullet had gone through his back and into his lungs and into his heart. There was no exit wound for the bullet at all. So it was clear that the bullet was still lodged inside of him. So they had to be aware of what was going on. The woman that called 911 that stopped to help them... She said that she was hoping that maybe it was a good thing that, you know, the bullet hadn't gotten out of him, that maybe it didn't miss any, or that it might have missed, you know, some main stuff, and that he was going to be okay. And they just waited with him and kept him comfortable and kept him calm while the paramedic showed up. And in that moment, the neighbor that had originally came over to help him first they were quoted saying that they just remembered his big brown eyes looking up at them and that it was just, he said that he knew that that Chris was gone and that there was nothing that they could do to help him, that he wasn't going to live through this injury, that it was, it was too severe and it caused too much damage. He had lost too much blood. It had gone to his heart, through his lungs. Like, it was just, it was very bad. There was no way he was going to make it. So, they knew that he was gone before the paramedics got there. But, they waited with him, obviously. And, Chris died on the side of the road with two complete strangers. But, at least he didn't die alone, you know. I know that's... I'm trying to kind of make it like a little silver lining, you know. But anyways, so he didn't die alone, but he did die with two strangers on the side of the road. And when paramedics got there, they obviously, they took him to the hospital. And whenever they got there, he was pronounced dead at 3.45 p.m. Now remember, he went on his run at 2.55 p.m. So he died in almost an hour, just an hour of being out and jogging and minding his business. His life was taken. I just put way, look at that. Oh my goodness, I just put way too much fun. Anyways, so he was only out jogging for about an hour before his life was taken away from him for absolutely no reason whatsoever. But anyways, so he was pronounced dead at the hospital at 3.45 p.m. And whenever the cops got there, they questioned the two people, you know, the name. That was so funny. My mouth just did that weird thing. Anyways, they questioned the two people that were there with Chris, the neighbor, and, you know, the woman that stopped by to help them and remember how I said that they you know were in a neighborhood so they were able to actually you know remember the make and the model of the vehicle that the boys were driving and the neighbor was able to give a description of the boys that were in the vehicle so that was very good that, you know, at least he wasn't, like I said, I'm trying to make silver lining. At least he wasn't alone on the side of the road in, like, a forest or in, like, a park or, you know, places like that where people go missing a lot of the times and they don't get found or, you know, they don't get noticed for 
weeks or more at a time. I'm trying to, you know, at least he was in, like, a well-populated area. So, the cops had the make and model of the vehicle, the color of the vehicle, and a slight description of the people that were in the vehicle at the time. So, that was all that they had to go on. So, at that point, you know... They did everything that they could, and they immediately went to look for CCTV footage, CCTV footage sorry, to find, you know, kind of like the, the course that Chris was jogging that day. And they were able to track him on a few things. And the reason I brought up, you know, that elementary school earlier, the intersection that they were in, is because... Actually, at that intersection, the elementary school had security cameras on their fence outside of their school. So, they actually caught Chris minding his business, jogging by, and they saw Michael's car, Black Focus, slowly trailing behind him. And at that moment, they knew, like... They were like, all right, we got them. This is the car that the people told us about. And this is, you know, this has got to be it. So, you remember how I told you that the boys had went to the church? And there was actually a man who called the police and noticed James Edwards outside holding the gun. And noticed exactly who he was and called the police and told them to make in the model of the vehicle. So in that moment, police are like, oh yeah, boys, we got them. And so they race over to the church. And at that moment, the boys were about to leave because remember how I told you that Michael and Chancey were trying to convince James to just get back in the vehicle. He's on probation. This isn't worth it. They just committed a terrible crime. They need to be, you know, they need to be on the run. And so the boys were actually in the process of pulling out of the church parking lot when police pull up and swarm them and arrest all three of the boys at 7 p.m., four hours after Chris Lane's death, they were all arrested. So, of course, they were split up whenever they were taken to the police station because they knew that they had to get one of the boys to confess and one of them to snap. So, and they were like, all right, we got to separate these jokers in order to actually get something out of them. So that's exactly what they did. They separated all three of them. And they worked them. And they worked them. Until they were able to get a confession out of James Edwards. He was the first one to talk about what happened. And told the story of the first one I told you. How they were in the car. And... Michael swerved, and Chancey's gun just happened to go off magically, you know, and kill this innocent man. Well, obviously, that was a crock of shit. I mean, we know that now. But that was the story that he tried to tell. So, James offered testimony against Michael and Chancey and was given a lesser charge of accessory after the fact and he pled guilty and he got 25 years he's actually the only one the passenger of the car james edwards who was standing outside of the church with another gun ready to hurt somebody else he actually is the only one who has gotten out of jail now i believe in changing your life and, you know, reforming for the better and, you know, rehab and making a better life for yourself and all of that. Yes, I totally support that. But I don't know how I feel about that because he was part of taking somebody's life. He wasn't just an accessory. Like, it was more than that. You know what I mean? It wasn't just an accessory. He wasn't just a purse. Like, he was a main character. But anyways, so... 
Michael pled guilty in July 2015 to second degree murder and he was given life with, you know, the possibility of having to serve 38 years before he could even get considered for parole. And now, I don't know. I feel like Michael probably should have gotten the lesser sentence out of all of them. I know he took somebody else's life as well, and he was also part of it. But he did give the full story. He did give the real story. He didn't give a lie like James did. James lied. And like I said, you know, he got out in 2018. And he's apparently living a sober life and doing good for himself and everything. But he lied. He didn't tell the real story. He fabricated and ended up being the one to get out of jail. Like I said, I just that just doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't sit right with me. None of it does. But that just really don't sit right with me for some reason. But anyways, so... Like I said, Michael got 30... He's got to serve 38 years before he can even get considered for parole. Like, at all. And, um... Mr. Tancy Luna was given life without parole in July 2015 for first-degree murder. He actually tried to go back to court, and the appeal, he got an appeal in 2018, and he got his sentence thrown out. He went back to court for resentencing, and actually ended up getting his original sentence, which just <laughs> cracks me up. It just tickles my booty. It just, it makes me so happy, but like, because he deserves it. Because throughout the entire time of the trial, apparently Chancey Luna was the most heartless. Look at good God. I'm telling you, Jeffrey, don't nobody do highlighter like Jeffrey freaking star. But anyways, so apparently the whole entire time throughout the whole trial and everything, like Chancey Luna was the most ruthless out of all of them. He didn't care. He didn't, you know, like, he didn't care of anything out. Sorry about that. He didn't care about anything, like, at all. He just wanted to do his thing, and that was that. Well, like I said, he's, you know, not getting out of prison, like, ever. And when it asked interrogation why they did it, it was stated that Michael said, you know, they were just bored, I guess. So... That was their reason of committing murder. They were just fucking bored. Which, okay, that, that doesn't justify taking someone's life for absolutely no reason whatsoever, but you do you, boo. So, Chris Lane's life was taken for seemingly no reason whatsoever. And it was cut short by... A bunch of teenagers who didn't care at all. You know, there was a possibility that this was gang-related. But, you know, we'll never know fully, honestly. Because they won't say anything about it more than what they already have. And that's just that. Like I said, it sucks really bad. And their families deserve to know the truth. But I guess we'll never know. Chris's body was taken back to Melbourne, Australia, and he was buried in his hometown. And there was a funeral held with all of his family and friends. Sarah was there. Everybody was there. And he was laid to rest in his hometown where he was born. And I'm glad that he was able to be back home with his family. I think that's where he should have been. And... I know it sucks so much for them, and I just, I can't imagine how that must feel to have somebody be living out their dreams and then to get their life taken by a bunch of people who don't care about anybody but themselves. But, yep, that was the story of Chris Lane and his tragic, tragic end of his life and how it was snuffed out by a bunch of teenagers who didn't care about anybody else. But yeah, so this is today's look on something simple. I feel weird just transitioning like that, but yeah. So let me know how you guys feel about today's story. 
And yeah, I'm glad that I could be here with you guys today. I enjoy making these videos. I kind of feel weird saying that sometimes. But like I just, I like doing these little videos, sitting here talking and doing my makeup and just spending some time with you guys. So let me know how you feel in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys next time. Just remember to stay safe and that I love you. Peace.